I'm going to discuss a bit about patent prosecution at the EPO, some important aspects uh, to consider. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to show some statistics of the EPO. So here we have uh, statistics of five patent applications from 2014 to 2018. And uh, we can see that it's quite steady. Um, it's on a relatively stable level, I would say. Uh, in 2018, we had 174,000 five patent application at the EPO, where most of them come from uh, applicants of mandatory states of the EPO. And secondly, 25% are filed by US, US applicants. And we can see that Japanese applicants are only 13% of the filed applications. So in numbers, we have 81 1,500 approximately from EPO states and 22,600 uh, file applications from Japanese applicants. Uh, so this is a bit misleading because uh, it includes PCT applications entering the EPO and uh, as every PCT application is automatically entered the EPO, Every application is included, and then uh, when the fees are not paid, the application is withdrawn. And now, so compared to uh, the US PTO, they have in 2018 approximately 645,000 file applica applications. And the Japanese stamp office, Dr. Uh, Sonoda, told me that they have filed 310,000 patent applications in 2018, so I say that the EPO is a bit after, unfortunately. And I don't want to go into China, because that's number one by far. And regarding statistics uh, of granted patents, we can see an increase during the last few years uh, Compared to the relatively stable level on the file applications, we have here a, a, quite an increase in granted applications. And Japanese patents, Japanese patent applications are 17 percent of the granted applications. And uh, EPO states, we have 57,900 granted patents in 2018, and from Japanese applicants, 21,000 approximately. Uh, the reason for the increase in growth rate, I would say, is probably because the EPO is reducing their backlog, speeding up their prosecution. And if we look at uh, the lead time statistics for all these uh, numbers are median values. So we have uh, for search, it's been reduced from 4.8 months to 4.4 months. And it's from the filing of the application until you receive the search report. Regarding examination, it's 22.1, 22.3. And this number is from when you request examination until uh, until the uh, grant of the application, so the total period for examination. And we have the uh, duration of opposition proceedings has been significantly reduced, I would say, from 22.4 to 18.6. Uh, percentage of international, international searches on time is when the EBO, um, acting as international searching authority, and provides the search report before the publication of the application. So it's quite, in most of the cases, you get the search report in due time. And finally, um, time to accelerate the examination action, 3.1 to 2.8 months. And this number is the from request of examination uh, to first communication or grant.
So, with regarding the patent application, how can we best prepare for entry at the EPO? What should we do and what should we not do? I'm going to discuss a little bit about some aspects of the application regarding amendments, the uh, units of the application, the description, and uh, finally, a little bit about computer implemented inventions. So, turning to amendments, and often we have filed the patent application and when we receive an office action, we might have to file, might have to amend the claims, depending on the prior art, of course. And the amendments that we do must be supported by the description. Um, we can take support in the description from the figures, but that is not recommended, but it is possible. Um, the amendment that we do here, it must be unambiguously derivable from the figures. So, even if it is accepted by the examiner, it, it might be a possible uh, way to attack the granted patent by a third party later on. Um, the claim, the amended claims must also be enabled. So, we cannot simply pick features from different embodiments and combine them if the resulting embodiment is not unambiguously derivable from the application. So, if we have, for example, feature A and B in the first embodiment and feature A and C in a second embodiment, it's not obvious, if it's not obvious that feature A, B, and C is derivable, then we cannot use that one. I'm a mechanics, mechanical engineer, and in that field I would say that this is often not a problem. When you describe your first and broader scope of protection, you describe the first embodiment, and then and when you turn to the next embodiment, you simply just have to describe that the features of the first embodiment are also included in the second one, and with the addition of feature C and D and so on. Turning to unity of the invention, the claims shall relate to one invention only. So, if we have claims relating to a second invention, these must be removed and file an additional application. So, compared to, for example, in the US, you can have a number of different independent claims defining the in, dif, sort of different inventions. This is not allowable. A PPO. In addition, Rule 43.2 of the EPC must be fulfilled, which requires that a plurality of interrelated products. So, if we have, we can have, if it relates to the same invention, we can have two claims in two independent claims in the same category. If it's, for example, is a flight and socket, we can have features relating to the flight and in one independent claim and features relating to the socket in a, another independent claim. Uh, we can have different use uh, different uses of a product or apparatus. Uh, this is more in the chemical and medical technology field, for example a substance for a number of medical uses, uh, second and further medical indication. And also, we can have different independent claims, independent claims in the same category if there are alternative solutions to a particular problem where it is inappropriate to cover these alternatives by a single claim. So, uh, one invention, but different claim categories are, of course, allowable, so we can have claims directed to a method, and claims directed to a device. That's allowable if they relate to the same invention. Turning to the description, it is recommended to describe a working embodiment for the broadest scope of protection 
that's defined by claim one. So if we have claim one defining features A, B, and C, it is recommended to describe how these A, B, and C work together and what effects they achieve. The broadest scope of protection should be enabled by the description. So the essential features in the invention must be included in the broadest scope. Um, so if a feature is not essential for the invention, then it should not be described as essential in the description. It's, you can also, just, so you should prefer to describe it as optional and then you can include it later on. <clears throat> and uh, it's recommended to be cautious when defining advantages of the broader scope of protection because uh, we have the features of the independent claim and the broader scope of protection, then we should stick to what advantages do these features uh, give to the invention. Uh, we should not describe advantages that are in fact achieved by other features that are probably included in dependent claims. So, but with regards to these features, it's, it is uh, advantageous to describe the advantages of the features in the independent claims as well, and what, how do they contribute to the invention. This will simplify when we later on should argue for inventive step in view of these features. At the ETO, um, the examiner will uh, say that you should include the closest prior art in the background section. It's defined in the European Patent Convention. But this is something that we prefer that we can do after we receive the circuit board. And then the examiner will say, so we don't think that you should put any effort in, in describing the, any good describing to a prior art document that you are aware of, but the examiner will probably demand you to describe the document that he finds more relevant. Finally, uh, shortly about computer implemented dimensions. Um, if the computer implemented the invention relates to solving a technical problem, then we often do not have any problem. Claims are handled according to normal practice. But if the invention relates to solving a non-technical problem, for example, a business problem or similar, it is practically possible uh, to get a granted patent. You could uh, also have a mix of technical and non-technical features in a claim of this type. And then uh, the examiner will, in such case, uh, remove uh, the non-technical features when evaluating if the invention is not an early also relative step. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, if you have a computer that performs a, lot, a number of non-technical method steps, such as a number of business <coughs> steps, the examiner will simply remove the non-technical steps and you will end up with a computer like this one, which is obviously not novel, and uh, that claim will be rejected. <coughs> well, that was my presentation. Thank you.